want to take this time to thank you for joining us today. I hope you enjoy the service. Pleasant Grove is a place that we call it the place of hope, and I'm sure there's other places of hope, but let me tell you why this is a place of hope. Only because the hope that lives here, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. I hope the Lord blesses you today and challenges you. Thanks for tuning in. God, I just come to you this morning, Lord, thankful that I serve a God who gives me strength every day. Lord, I just pray right now as we get ready to start into this time of service, Lord, that you would be with us, God, that you would be welcome into this place. God, we thank you for our changed lives today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Be seated. Amen. We have four coming this morning to, uh, to identify with Christ in baptism. And first of all, this is Gabby Gray. And Gabby, because you've repented of your sins, placed your faith in Jesus, and surrendered to him as the Lord of your life, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Brother Christian Gray. He's a tall drink of water right here, buddy. Get way up here because you're going to hit your head on that thing. <laughs> I've had the opportunity to know him for a long time, and uh, I'll tell you what, uh, it's a pleasure to baptize you, buddy. I guarantee I love the way you, uh, I love your walk and how um, 
how you encourage others. So, Christian, because you've invited Christ into your heart, you surrender to him as the Lord of your life. I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. taste his own medicine. You know, Ryan was a church member, or is a church member, and uh, still had to settle the fact that he know Christ is Lord and Savior. He did that just a couple weeks ago. And Ryan, because you've invited Christ into your heart, placed your faith in him and trusted him as the Lord of your life, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Next, there's a special baptism here. Donovan Carey uh, will be baptizing his daughter Chandler. And uh, uh, what a, I mean, it's just, um, anytime you get to baptize your child, it's huge. But when somebody comes at a young age to know the Lord, uh, it, it's amazing what God will teach them at that much length in their life of knowing Christ. So, Donovan, you come. As they turn the house lights up, I want to ask you to stand. If you're visiting with us for the first time, we'd love for you to get back and uh, see Sherry and have you back and guest information. Uh, if it's been a while or if we hadn't been able to see you or talk to you, boy, we're glad that you're here this morning. And uh, so this time, find somebody, fellowship. Welcome to the house of God. We're glad you're here. And uh, I hope you enjoy your day.
afraid to leave my past behind And I won't be shaken Sing that! I won't be shaken Cause my fear doesn't stand a chance When I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance When I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance
goes strangely, strangely dim in his life. Sing it one more time. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Amen. Well, here's the thing. We're trying to do something for God big time. And we got our eyes on everything but him. And it only works when we turn our eyes on Jesus. Amen, church. I want you to take your Bibles this morning, turn to the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 7. And we are still in our series on U-turns, and this morning, our U-turn is anxiety, fear. You know, we can sing songs about fear. We can sing songs about turning from our fear. Uh, and we could even say, I'm not afraid, but then we realize that uh, fear has trapped many of us. Fear has is just kind of weight on our shoulders, if you will. How many of you know what it's like to be afraid? Yeah. How many of you like to know, some of, how many of you know what it's like to, as a believer, walking in fear that, can I really trust God on this? How many of you have ever been there? Raise your hand. Yeah. And, and I'll be honest with you, we can trust God with our eternal life. What we have problems with is our day-to-day. -day. We, we know that if we pray and we invite Christ into our life to become our personal Savior, we could even say we believe that. I'm going to heaven. Ain't no doubt in my mind, but the day-to-day -day is what we have problems with. Can God pay my bills? Can God feed my family? Can I pay my house note? Can I do what God's called me to do? Those are things we fear. And the scripture even tells us that God's not given us a spirit of fear, but a power of love and of a sound mind. We can know all the scripture. I've learned this in my, in my walk with the Lord. You can know all the scripture you want to know. It still, it does, still doesn't mean that you're going to walk by what that scripture says. You, have a, you literally live a life of every day choosing if I'm going to walk with God, if I'm going to believe God, or if I'm going to believe me and do things my way. And I'm sad to say that many times I choose to do things my way. I have to go back and get it fixed, but I usually light out without God <laughs> and then have to turn around and think, boy, why would I do that? I knew better. Why would I do that? So take your Bibles and turn to the book of uh, Matthew chapter, um, I said seven, chapter six, I'm sorry. If you'd stand with God's word and we're going to read several verses, a lot of scripture this morning, but um, sure don't apologize for that. Um, but I want you to, we're going to read it together, begin with the verse number 25. Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more than they are? Which of you by worrying can add one cubit to its stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Verse 30. Now, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? Then he says this, O oh, you of little faith. Therefore, do not worry saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For after all these things, the Gentiles, after all these things, the Gentiles speak. Seek. For your heavenly father knows that you, what all you need and the things that you need. 
Look at verse 33. This is a verse. It's one of those, what they would call a coffee cup verse that we hear a lot. And it's easy to quote, man. It is hard to flesh out. Look what it says in verse 33. It says, but seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, every time you see the word therefore, you need to ask yourself, what's it there for? So I'm going to tell you, do not worry about tomorrow. How many of you are fretting? Don't raise your hand. I'm just asking a question just for you to ponder. How many of us are fretting about what even hadn't even happened yet? We're fretting about what's going to happen tomorrow. Listen to what scripture says. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. And Father, I pray that today, Lord, we would, uh, we would realize, Lord, what your scripture says, what the word of God says about how we're to trust you and to follow you. Lord, I, I, I profess right now that it's more, it's easier said than done a lot of times. Lord, when things come our way, we get stressed out and we, we worry and we fret. And the whole time, Lord, you know everything that we need and how to get through it, how to get us through it. If we just trust you, if we just put all our trust and fall in love with you. Lord, I pray you'd help us to love you more than we've ever loved you before. I pray for perfect love in our life. Grow us. And I pray that you be with us in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. You know, we worry about things we can't control, don't we? You can't control what's going to happen tomorrow. Maybe, maybe you can based on a decision you made because we do have uh, circumstances that happen because of decisions we make, good or bad. But for the most part, you can't control what's going to happen tomorrow. But 100%, you can't control how you go through what happens tomorrow. You have your emotions, one, you, you are 100% in control of how you walk through what faces you tomorrow. Now, I just heard this story, I thought it was good. There was a man in an airport and he, uh, he went up and he wasn't really afraid of flying, but he went up and he saw this kiosk and it said, you can buy flight insurance, $200,000 worth of flight insurance for $10. He thought, you know what, I'm not really scared of flying, but if something happens, that would be, my family sure would love an extra $200,000. So he paid the fare, got the insurance. He was there a little early. He thought he would go to eat some, uh, go eat some food. So he thought Chinese is what I want. So he goes to the Chinese restaurant. He orders, he gets his food. And at the end, what do they give you at the end of the Chinese restaurant? Fortune cookie. Somebody said, oh, I don't read that. Well, he did. And here's what he said. Here's what the fortune cookie said. It said, he opened it and he read, your recent investment will soon pay big dividends. <laughs> what a blessing. <laughs> you know, um, he wasn't worried about flying before he bought that, but he got a little worried after he bought that. Our emotions are responders. When we hear news that we really, we really don't like, all of a sudden we start worrying. Some people worry when they don't have anything to worry about. And so I want you to understand what scripture says about worry. So the truth is this, is that emotions have no intellect. You totally decide, decide how you're going to, how you're, you're going to allow your emotions to run wild with you. And I can say this for everybody in this room, and I know this. In the last month, we've had to learn how to deal with some emotions, haven't we? There's been fear all over our country and all over our world. There's been fear of how I can't do this, or can I do this, or I have to wear this, can I have to wear that? I'm going to tell you something. There's this big discrepancy right now of, are you going to take the vaccine or not take the vaccine? And I'm not here to tell you if you should or shouldn't. I'm just saying this. If you don't take the vaccine, you still got to trust God. If you do take the vaccine, you still got to trust God. How many of you believe that? 100%. So here's it. Everything we do, we don't do anything without trusting God. As a believer, we march to the beat of his drum. Sometimes we don't even know it's, sometimes we don't even know where we're going, but to the best of our ability as a believer, we're stepping out trying to follow what God has told us in his word. And so I have learned that we have gone through anxiety on a whole nother level when it comes to, when it comes to COVID and all the stuff that we've been through. So, so your level of worry and anxiety, here's the deal. It's up to you and it's up to me. So I want to give you four concepts this morning when as it pertains to anxiety. Here's number one. 
concern over anxiety. A lot of people say, well, Chris, when things come as an adult and as a responsible adult, I have to be concerned because I have to get a plan. Nobody's arguing with that. But problem is, is when concern turns into anxiety, it's when concern overwhelms you and you can't do anything about worrying about what's about to happen or where this is headed. Now, there are three times in Matthew chapter 6 that we just read in chapter in verse number 25, verse 31 and verse 34, where he says this, do not fear. In fact, you've heard me say this before, but 365 times in the word of God, it says, do not fear. One for every day of your life. But we still have a problem fearing. See, here's the thing. When we're concerned, we go to God and we ask God for a plan. And there are times when we say, I already know what to do. Here's what God wants. He just wants you to acknowledge that he is the ultimate answer. And he just wants you to ask him for the directions. See, God doesn't want, God, God allows us to do some things, but God wants to be included. And God wants you to say, listen, as a father, there is nothing greater than when my kids will ask me for my advice. It don't happen as much as it used to. Dad, how to? But when they say, hey, Dad, I'm having a problem. I, I'm, listen, God can literally work in their life as an adult to figure out the problem. In fact, Dalton and Leslie just got married last week. They're going to have some. Y'all going to have some, tell me. And I can, listen, as the old man, <laughs> I can sit over on the couch and say, I'm going to call them and tell them what they need to do. I can fix this for them in a minute. But you know what? They'll never learn anything if I'm the one doing all the fixing. As we grow with Christ, as we, go, we grow in our relationship with Christ, here's some things that happen. There are some things that we know to do and we learn to do as we grow a little older. Still, we don't, God doesn't want us to set him to the side and say, God, I just want to come to you about this, this issue because, Lord, I think I know what. But Lord, I want you to confirm it through the word of God and through my spirit. And, Lord, I know ultimately you're the answer. Sometimes we get too big for our britches as believers to the point that we act like, we may not, not say this, but we act like we don't need anybody to tell us what to do. Here's the thing. When scripture tells us do not fear, and then we decide to fear anyway, the Bible says this, to him that knows to do good and does it not, to him it is what scripture says. So for you to walk around worried and scared of the air you're breathing or every step that you're going to make, listen, you, know, you might want to say, well, I'm gonna, I don't want to mess up. If you're breathing, you're going to mess up. It's going to happen. Somebody said, well, I don't want to do that because, boy, I'm liable to make a mess out of it. You will. You will. But I can tell you this. God wants you to walk out, out there on that limb where it's almost touching the ground. Not getting away from the trunk, the presence of God, but getting out here where you're saying, God, if you don't come through, Lord, I'm sunk. I'm sunk. See, we like to stand up here close to the tree. When, my dad, when I was a kid and my dad was home, or uh, so I'd love to used to crawl. I used to love to crawl up in the chair with my dad when I was a kid. I remember that. And I'm a little too big, and Dad's been gone a little too long for me to do that right now. But I'm going to tell you, there are times that I can close my eyes and think about the things that Dad has taught, or that the Word of God has taught. And I'm going to tell you what. It's almost, like, it's almost like there's opportunity just to sit there and think, yeah, I knew that, but I just needed to remember that. Sometimes in the Christian's life, you know what to do because you've done it before. You just need to be reminded sometimes of what to do. See, we know how good God is, but then there are times we need to be reminded by how good God is. We know that he will supply our need. We just need to be reminded that he will supply our need. And I believe that God sometimes allows us to walk down an alley sometimes thinking, God, I don't understand. Just to stop us just a minute and say, Chris, you know what to do. Yeah, Lord, I remember now. You're right. See, the relationship that you have with the Lord is the kind of relationship, not that you hear audibly. I've never heard God audibly, but the relationship that you have to where you're thinking God begins to deal with your mind. You're thinking there is nothing in my flesh that wants to please God. So er, evidently that thought in my mind is coming from the Lord and I'm just going to have to by faith follow what that is telling me to do. 
See, my dad used to say something a long time, a lot of times. He said, Chris, there's a lot of days that I don't feel saved. Have y'all ever had those days in your life? I don't feel saved. I don't feel, boy, the presence of God. I don't feel like, whoo, son, I just happy, happy, happy. There's days that look like that. I said, well, dad, what do you do then? He said, Chris, that's when I walk with God by faith. And I rewind the tape in his mind, and his tape was Children's Road, where he told me about going down a long hill at a pine stump and invited Christ in his life. In my life, it was Mount Perry Church of God on a Tuesday night where I invited Christ into my life. And I rewind the tape, and I'm thinking, you know, God, I don't really feel saved today, but by faith, I know that I am. Why? Because I was there. I know the change it made in my life. The problem for me sometimes was before that day, the problem for me was I had nowhere to take that, that negative thought, that negative spirit back to. But man, when I really got saved when I was 19, I was able to take him back to the place. Man, every time I talk to Eddie Milton, it reminds me of that night. So he says that life brings concerns, but worry is when concern controls you. Look at, we're going to rewind the tape just a little bit. Look one verse up. In verse 24, and he talks about one of the greatest triggers of worry, and I guarantee it hits everybody in this room, and it's the worry of our resources, money. The Bible says this. The Bible says in verse 24, it says, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon or money. You got to let go of one of those people that are controlling you, one of those things that are controlling you. I would suggest you wouldn't let go of God. You cannot serve two masters. And one of the greatest triggers we have, and then he says this, he said in the book of James, he says that an unstable man is, or, or a, a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. See, we can't be following God here and following resources here and following God here and lack of resources here. We cannot serve two masters. Either you're going to love one and hate the other. You cannot serve God and money. The scripture, as I said, calls it uh, double-minded. Let me read that, verse, that passage of scripture in the book of James. It says this. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect. Now, the word perfect doesn't mean sinless. The word perfect means mature. It means complete. Hopefully, as a believer, I'm more complete now than I was when I was 19. As I learn the things of God, as I spend time with God, as I get to know who he is, there he is completing my life, but I'm not complete yet. I'm not there. We'll talk a little bit more about uh, perfect in a minute. He says, but let patience have its perfect work. In other words, don't try to get out of the fire too early. Let me just say something right here. I don't know who you are, and I don't know who this is for, but I'm going to go ahead and say it, and you just, D.L. Moody says, I'm making shoes, and one fits wear it, so I'll just make a shoe right here. There are times that when we go to God in prayer, we're praying for the wrong thing. We're praying for God to deliver us. And what we need to be praying is that God would disciple us through See, we learn when we're in the dirt. We learn when we're in the ditch. We learn when we're on the bottom of the mountain. That's when we learn when we struggle. But we don't like to struggle. That's not, hey, that is not in my, uh, it's not on my bucket list to struggle, God. I'm just going to tell you. Paul said that I may know him in the fellowship of his blessing. Is that what it said? Well, we don't know your Bible. What does it say? In the fellowship of his Suffering, you better believe it. How am I going to get to know who God is? How am I going to know how to turn left or right? How am I going to know when, I, when, when, I'm, when I'm totally without who I can depend on? How am I going to know? Because he's done it many times before through suffering. Now, in verse 5 of James chapter 1, he says this. If any one of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But look at this, but let him ask in faith. Hmm. Let him ask in faith with, with no doubting. 
For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. And it, then we get to that word we just used. For let no one suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. When you ask and you doubt when you ask, let that man suppose that he will receive nothing from the Lord. Hmm. Then he says this, for he is double-minded, a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. Unstable. You know, um, the word double-minded means to try to go in two different directions. And I, I'm going to tell you something. There are many people that call themselves men and women of God who are trying to go in two different directions. They, they, they have come forward, they've prayed prayers, they've done all those things, they went through baptistry waters, they've done all the things, but they have yet to wave the white flag and surrender their life to the one that can change their life and the one who can sustain their life, and that's God Almighty. But they have yet to say, God, I surrender my life to you. Not I surrender my day. Not, God, I'm going to do better. I'm not doing this as much as I used to. I'm going to surrender my life to you. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. You know, um, I don't have one up here. Anybody got an empty cup? You drank coffee and you still got it? You got one? That's good right there. Do I need ice? I ain't going to drink it. No. <laughs> Emery. It's a nice pink color. <laughs> I have a question for you. What's in this cup? Nothing. I hear you. <laughs> That's called Drayson carries her daddy boy. <laughs> There's nothing in here but air, right? No matter how I turn it upside down, if I shake it, what's in this cup now? Right, nothing but air. But if I take this cup so you got it now. Is it full of water? It's got some water in it. The more water I put in this cup, the less air I've got. In your spiritual cup, many of you are walking around almost empty. And the way that you're going to, the way that you're going to get rid of a lot of the junk in your life, the fear in your life, the anxiety in your life, you got to not just say, I'm going to get rid of it, but you got to fill up your spiritual cup with more of Jesus. Because the more you put of, more of him you put in your life, the less anxiety, fear, and the things that are not of God are going to be in that cup. We walk around afraid all the time, y'all. Well, I don't want to ask God for this because he might say no. You already don't have it. Somebody said, I'm going to try it for the baseball team. I probably won't make it. You're already not on the team. Why don't you give it a shot? You'd never know. And there's some people on the team that shouldn't be there. Anyway, I'm just saying. <laughs> when God invades the space of your emotions, worry has to leave. So see, our problem is not just about getting rid of the anxiety or, or getting rid of the fear. That's not, our, that's not the antidote of our problem. The problem is not, I got fear, I got to get rid of it. Nope. Let's go a little further. When God invades your space of your emotions, worry has to leave. The presence of God leaves no room for fear. No room. Now, I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about some things that, that are responsible fear that you, as a, as a parent, you have to be concerned about. You have to make sure that you take care of your business. We all know that. And there are, there are even things to where people have a, some chemical issues to where medication is needed. I'm not talking about that. But I'm talking about people that are worrying and walking around fretting every day of their life, not enjoying the goodness of God and the victory that can only be found in Christ. Now, I'm going to tell you something. It is, listen, it is attainable to have a, a walk with God where there's victory in your life. There it is. You know, um, let's go to point number two, love over fear. The Bible says this. 1 John 4, 18 says this. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Because fear involves torment, but he who fears has not been made perfect in love. Then he goes to verse 26 and he says this. Have you considered the birds? 
<laughs> Have you considered nature? We got birds all over our house. They light everywhere. There's some kind of birds that I don't, I don't want to say what they're building their nest out of, but it, it looks like throw up. I don't know if it's worm throw up, what kind it is, but then the corner, just mud, just junk everywhere. And every year, knock a nest down, they come back and put, you know, they call them barn swallows. I don't know, I guess that's what you call it. But you know what? Every day, they do not sit in that nest and say, all right, God, drop a worm. I'm right here waiting. You know what they do? They jump out of that nest. They go hunting for worms. But they trust God that God will supply the worms for their food. He said, consider the birds. Doesn't nature itself teach us that, hey, God's got this? God's got you? He said, well, Chris, I, I tell you what, I have a hard time believing that. I'm going to tell you something, you may, but when you finally get a hold of that, I'm going to tell you, it'll change your life, son, to realize that God's got it all. Now, one of the characters of perfect love, here's the word that love literally means, maturity. As you grow in Christ, as you walk with God, there's going to be some things that used to make you totally fear at this level, but as you've gone through some things, as you mature, guess what's going to happen? That's where God is, is producing Perfect love in your life. Complete love. Love where you're saying, you know what? I've trusted him for years. I can still trust him now. I've been walking with God 36 years. And I can tell you something. There are things that I trust him more now than I did then, but I still don't trust him 100%. Y'all right? Yeah. It's still a growth process. It's still a walk with God. It is still a relationship that I am learning. How God, how do I trust you in this? I can promise you this. I've used this illustration many times. I'll use it again. But at this level right here, well, I think it's monumental the trust I'm having to have. But as I go through some things and I pray through some things and I ask God to grow me through this, I get on the other side, but I don't realize I passed through. You understand? I don't realize, okay, I, I, well, I made it through that. But it's almost like the next time I've gone through some things, I'm going through some things again. But this time, those things, if I'd have had this kind of, if I'd have needed this kind of faith when I was down there, guess what? Oh, I'd have never made it. God is in the process of growing his people, growing his children, growing us to where we're saying, God, I can trust you for the big things. How do you know that? Because I have learned to trust you, first of all, in the small things. And as I walk with God a little bit at a time, I grow, I grow, I grow. Now, if somebody comes up to you, to you and tells you how much they're growing, they're probably not growing as much as they think they are. See, 2 Timothy says this, Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of, but of, but of power, it's on the screen. I thought I was, sorry, I threw your curve there. Not their fault, mine. I added that this morning. I thought it was good. God's not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. Can I tell you, every time I see that word love, I just have to be honest with you. I think more about loving my brothers and sisters. Because in my mind, I'm thinking, I love God. I just have trouble with the horizontal sometimes. Y'all right? Yes, sir. But the Bible says that God's not giving us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love. You know what that word love means? It means that I'm supposed to love people like Jesus loves them. You're going to need some help with that. Yes, sir. Now, verse 27, he says, which of you by worrying can, had, can add any cubit to his statue? In other words, what is worrying going to change in your life? I read this statement this, this week, and I thought it was good. I'll repeat it to you. And it said this, we've lost our awe of God. God is, we hear him now, is referred to as the man upstairs or the big guy or my, my homie or what. Listen, he is God of God, King of kings, and Lord of lords. He ain't your homie. He is the God of all gods. But I can tell you this, when we lose our awe of God of how big he really is, we get a small vision of what God can really do. 
something to think about. <laughs> and this may apply to others more than others. You're going to love this. Scripture says in Luke 12, 7, but the very hairs on your head are all numbered. Do not fear, therefore. You are more valuable, valuable than sparrows. This will help some of y'all. The average head of hair has right at 100,000 strands on it. Some of you are not average. <laughs> but the average head of hair has 100,000 strands, whether you can see them or not. Average. As you get older, not as much. Now you got to think about how many people are in this world. Seven billion. You multiply that out, you get into the octillions. You can't count those numbers. And that's just the ones that are alive now. So Chris, what are you trying to say? God says he has them all numbered. He knows every hair on your head. When you comb, when you put a comb through it and you look and the comb has got, uh, uh, the comb's got hair on it. Well, there's eight, nine, 25, 60,000 and two. Okay. He knows every one of them. He knows every one of them. And could it not be that if he knows every hair on the octillion people's head, don't you think for a minute he could handle your problem? Don't you think that he would at least know what the problem is or you wouldn't have to keep going to him every day about the same problem? God already knows what the problem is. Here's what he wants you to do. He wants you to confess that you know what it is so that he can say, okay, Chris, now that you figure out what it is, now we can start the path to getting out of what it is. You know, um, I just realized we're wasting a lot of energy worrying about things we can't control. Isaiah 26, 3 says this, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. John 16, 33, these things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. Wow. Somebody asked me one time, I said, Chris, when you got saved, what did, what did, what did being saved really mean to you? I'm going to tell you, I spent a lot of sleepless nights not knowing if I was going to sleep through the night and make it. So when somebody asked me, I said, Chris, what does being saved mean to you? Here's 100% what it means to me. Peace to sleep at night. And when I realized that <laughs> you, I'm talking to God, God, you will keep me in perfect peace. And I would like to say it like this. If my mind stays on you because I trust in you. These things have I spoken to you that in me you may have peace. I can't tell you. Listen, you may be sitting there wondering, Chris, how can you know that you know that you know that you know? I'll tell you why. Because when God changed my life and the Holy Spirit came to live in my life, he gave me peace like nobody ever could. Peace. It's not just to sleep at night. It's to ride down the road. Do you realize how close you are to dying every time you meet a car head on? Do you think that, that you think it's by happenstance, coincidence, that you don't hit head on every time you see a car? You look down the road and a guy or a woman is probably texting, they veer way over in your lane, and you think, well, this ain't gonna end well. Then all of a sudden out of nowhere, they pull the car back over. It ain't because they saw you or heard you, it's because the Spirit of God said, hey, maybe the angel grabbed the wheel, I don't know. We live in a state of total dependence on who God is and what God can do. Somebody said, Chris, I know this, uh, I know you, people, this guy, he worked hard for everything he's got. But it still wasn't him that gave it to him. I love this scripture because it's a song that goes with it. Some of you may even know it. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is in the Lord. For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, which spreads out its roots by the river and will not fear when heat comes. But its leaf will be green and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. I can still see my dad playing this little song in church when I was a kid. Some of you may know it. And he used to take his guitar and he would be right here. And it was this song. I shall not be, 
I shall not be moved. You ever heard that song? I shall not be, I shall not. Just like a tree is planted by the waters, I shall not be moved. I remember that like it was yesterday. And every time I read a scripture like that, I'm reminded of that little, that little, that little, just that little uh, chorus that he would sing. And I realized something. 1 Corinthians 15, 58 speaks to that as well. Be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as you know, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Be ye steadfast, unmovable. Listen to me. Now, I'm not just speaking to new Christians, but I am speaking to new Christians. When you decide to be a follower of Christ, there are gonna be a lot of times when changing addresses spiritually is going to be attractive. Scripture says, be you steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as you know, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. There's going to be days you can't figure it out, but you stick by the stuff. Listen to me, you stick by the stuff. You know, um, everybody knows Hope that went in the net cup because that was good. I just thought about that time I picked up and drank. Like, I don't know where that cup's been. <laughs> Trust the Lord either way, Thomas. <laughs> well, my chest is burning. What was in that? <laughs> Everybody gives me a hard time being, about a, being a fool about my grass, okay? And uh, I am. I cut it with scissors and put, a, I don't put lasers on it to make sure it's right, you know. But I read a story. I, I may have shared this years ago, but I just happened to think about it this morning. I want to share it again. I think it's, I think it's worth, and we'll close after this, Stacey. I, I just want to share this. There was a vineyard. I think it was over in, in uh, Rome or something like that, but there was two vineyards that were across the street from each other. And those two vineyards, that year, there became, there was a drought, man. There was no rain. There was nothing going on. And so they thought, you know what? We'll do an experiment. So when the rains did not come, on one field, they irrigated. They had the sprinklers going. They had it, man. And that field right there was as green and lush as you could imagine. On the other side of the road, they just let it suffer. They just let it go through some heat. They just let it go through some hard times. And boy, you could tell it. You look out there at that, at that vineyard and it was kind of dry and beaten and it had the signs of no rain. And so that year, they probably harvested their crop. The next year, they came back. And it was a normal year. They had rain and had all kind of stuff. But something was different. See, the, 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 the vineyard that had all of the irrigation and all the pampering and all the help, man, that, that thing was green and luscious. There's only one thing about it. They didn't plant a vineyard to raise leaves. They planted a vineyard to raise grapes. And so that next year they came back and the rain was there. It was a normal year, irrigation and all was about a normal year for everything. And that vineyard over there that had been through the hard times. That vineyard that went over there that had been through the dry, had, had been shriveled up, and everybody walked by and said, I wouldn't buy no grapes from there. All of a sudden, man, that thing was green and luscious. They hadn't done anything to it. And they looked over at the vineyard that had been pampered the year before. It was kind of green, had a few grapes. But see, the year before, what you couldn't see is while this one was being pampered, this one over here, the roots were going deep, going deep. And I'm going to tell you something. When you find yourself going through struggles, when you find yourself going through the heat, and when you find yourself not looking like what you think you ought to look like and not being what you think you ought to be, let it be, a, let it be, a, uh, let it be an encouragement to you that, hey, listen, I can't figure it out. I don't understand what's going on. But I'm going to do what I know to do when I don't know what to do. And he just kept growing deeper and deeper and deeper. And the next year, both of them kind of were green. 
but the proof was in the taste. They went over here to the vineyard that had not suffered. They pulled a grape. Oh, it was plump and juicy, man. Big, huge grape. Popped it in their mouth. Burst in their mouth. Wasn't much to it. A lot of water. But they went over here. Grape for normal size, not bigger than normal. But man, when they put that grape in their mouth, they bit into that grape and it burst into their mouth, they realized something. These are going to be some of the best grapes that we've ever produced. What's the key? The key was in order for God to do a great work in your life, it's going to include suffering. You said, Chris, I, I'm afraid of suffering. <laughs> I don't want to go through hard times. Who does? But you also say in the same, ver- the same breath, God, I, I want you to do something great in my life. Chuck Swindoll says it best. In order for God to do a great work, he takes a great man and crushes him and then rebuilds him to be the man he wants him to be. Charles Stanley went through a divorce in his family. He just retired from his church right at 90 years old. America's pastor. Here's what he said. He said, I'll never again hire anybody based on their ability. Only based on their brokenness. Wow. Some of you may be going through brokenness right now. I don't know. And for some of you, your brokenness may include your health. Maybe your health. It could be your family. It could be your job. But man, you're saying, well, I tell you what, I don't know what's going on in my life, but it seems like everything is upside down in my life. Can I tell you to do something? Without even knowing your circumstance, I'm going to tell you to do something. Lock in. Lock in. He says, putting on the armor of God that my feet may be shod with the gospel of preparation of peace. It means to lock in. Hey, here's what I mean. Get ready for battle because it's coming. Get ready for it. Satan, listen, Satan has every desire to turn your life upside down. And guess what? He's in no hurry. He'll keep shooting until you draw your last breath. Would you pray with me all over this room? Let me ask you a question. Your head's bowed, your eyes closed. How many would be honest to say, I feel, Chris, I've, I felt this suffering, but I didn't really realize it. But for a while, it's been, I've felt like it was kind of for no reason. I'm just going through it. Maybe God's mad at me or something. I'm just suffering because how many would be honest with your hands and raise your hand and say, listen, I, this suffering sometimes, I didn't know where it's coming from, but I realized God's going to do a work in my life. Let me see your hand. I know God's going to do a work in my life. Thank you. I know God's going to do a work in my life. But he's not going to do it halfway. God's not going to give you half a testimony. God's going to do everything he wants to do in your life as long as you continue to keep your heart open to what he wants to do. Here's what he really wants you to do. Lock in. Stay in the fight. Realize he's not giving you the spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. And for many, you have been on the anxiety roller coaster. And for some of you, it's time to turn around, make a U-turn on that thing and get this thing right. Because here's what I learned. If you're anxious about everything and you're, uncon- you're unconfident about anything and Satan's got you there because you can't be effective for any of the things of God. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Your head's bowed and your eyes are closed. But several of you raised your hands and said, listen, I'm, I'm literally feel like I'm upside down right now. But I know God wants to do something big in my life. While people are praying, 
I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat and come to the spot on this altar and just pour your heart out to God and say, Lord, I know you're speaking to me. While I'm speaking, do that right now. Do that right now. I'm not coming after to get you. You do that right now. You know God's doing a work in your life. You know it. Just come to him and pour his heart out to you. Pour, pour your heart out to him and say, Lord, I give. I surrender. Do that right now. Don't keep putting it off because you know what you need to do. Don't keep putting, keep putting it off. Maybe you're here this morning, you've never trusted Christ. You've never surrendered to the Lord. You've never done that. You've been so close thinking I ought to do this. But man, I'm going to tell you what he wants. He wants out of your life is to jump in with both feet and surrender to him. Maybe you need to join this fellowship. Maybe you need to be baptized, whatever the case may be. But this morning, if you've never invited Christ into your life, Romans 10, 13 says, for whosoever that calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's you. You're a whosoever. So in just a moment, we're going to stand. She's going to begin to sing. And the door's wide open for you. You just come do business with God. I don't know who you are or what your need is, but I know this. He knows everything about us. Father, we love you. Praise you for what you mean to us. In Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand together. You need to come. You come right now as Stacy sings. We'd like to thank you today for watching our online service here at Pleasant Grove Baptist Church. We hope that God has spoke to you and moved in your life uh, and is drawing you closer to Him. God bless you.